like this you one, the big one dude. G'day. I'm out here getting a few tips from an expert on how to set cray pots and catch crays. Now you can call these lobsters if you like. They taste the same. But I've got a theory. To get a feed, you don't always need a cray pot. That's what I call a crayfish. Now, what I'm doing here, I've got a pair of pantyhose. Now, I've put a weight in it and I've put some bait in. And my theory is that I can toss this in and get a crayfish. Now, that's the same theory I use in the inland to catch the inland crayfish, the yabbies. Now, I'm going to see if it works. Here, tie this on for you, Stephen. Do you really reckon this is going to work, Jack? Look, mate, you're going to learn something here. See, you've got to go with these new ideas. Now, I don't think my colleague here is impressed but this is the way I catch one inland crayfish. Now, we won't know till tomorrow till I come back and have a look. You got any money on this one, Jack? Yeah. Now that that's organised, I'll show you where we are. I want you to imagine a line going off our stern, across our wake, over the Southern Ocean, over the Indian Ocean, across the South Atlantic, right to the coast of South America. This route we're travelling is exactly the route of the Roaring Forties. This very dangerous sea line that is 40 degrees south of the equator. Nothing gets in the way of the great seas and the howling winds of the Roaring Forties. Nothing, that is, until you get to the coast of where we're heading, King Island. These are the shallow waters of Bass Straits, and really what they're covering was once a land bridge in Ice Age times. But when the seas flooded back in, all that was left standing was the mountain peaks, surrounded by some of the most dangerous sailing waters in the world, known as Bass Strait. King is the most isolated of all these islands. Its treacherous rocky coast blocks one third of the western entrance to Bass Strait. For sailing ships running with the Roaring Forties, this was often their first sight of land, and sometimes their last. Nowhere along this coast are there any natural harbours. Even here at Curry, the fishing fleet has to find its way through a narrow entrance surrounded by treacherous reefs. Once, this was the only way you could get to King Island, by sea. So, not very many people came here unless they had a very special reason to do so. that isn't true today, you can get here by air. But it meant for a long time that King Island was left very much to itself. Over the years, King Island has developed a special way of its own. Now, there's got to be something special about this place. 
because although it's the most isolated of all the islands, it has the biggest population. Over 2,000 people live on the island. Most of them live in Curry. The first surprise you get when you get here is how big this place is. Like it's 60 kilometres long and 20 wide and there's enough roads on it to keep you driving all day. Believe it or not, this is some of the finest pastoral country in Australia, where they produce top quality beef, top quality dairy cows and fine quality wools. Most of the roads are protected or sheltered by tea tree scrub or sand dunes and you often forget where you are. But not for very long. Even in good weather, this coast looks a dangerous place and believe me it is because the shipwreck that took place in this bay over 150 years ago is still the biggest disaster in Australian maritime history. Almost 70 ships have been wrecked on the reefs around King Island. In fact, over 800 people have lost their lives, either been drowned or died of exposure when they come ashore. One night in particular, nearly 400 people lost their lives out here because of one wreck and the ship was the Kataraki. This all happened on a very stormy night in 1845 and as rough as the sea was, really human error was the main reason for this shipwreck. By the time she got to Bass Strait, the Kataraki had been 105 days out of Liverpool, England. Aboard were 369 passengers and 46 crew, all wet and miserable. The Kentaraki for weeks had been sailing through shocking weather, driving rain and squalls, and they had not seen a sight of land. Worse still, they hadn't seen the sun nor the stars of a night. The captain wasn't sure of his position. He was afraid he was too close to King Island. Night was falling so he decided to do the sensible thing and drop anchor. And then he did a stupid thing. He allowed himself to be talked into sailing on. They were only 100 metres offshore, but mountainous seas, driving rain, and pitch black night. In the end, out of over 400 people, only nine made it ashore. This is a tragic story, but the most tragic thing about it is it should have never happened. The captain of the Kataraki had no intention of sailing on the night. But after he'd hove to, some of his officers said that he'd lost his nerve. And to prove them wrong, he set sail again. But within one hour, they had come to grief. And that very night, nearly 400 people lost their lives. I want to do a painting along this coast but I'm not going to do it here because this place is too sad for me. But at the other end of the bay, there is another wreck, the Netherby, and I'm going to paint that. The Netherby was a much bigger ship than the Kataraki. In fact, she carried 500 passengers and crew, and she struck in the night out on the reef beyond those rocks. But the Netherby was lucky, she didn't break up. She was taking water badly, but the passengers helped to man the pumps, and by dawn they'd got a line ashore. 
And this is the scene as I see it. It was a remarkable rescue, a miracle if you like, because not one single life was lost. But what I'm trying to do here is tell the story of three of the passengers. A woman and her two children came ashore. They were shivering and she had a red shawl and placed it around them to keep them warm. How do I know it was a red shawl? This is the original red rug that was brought ashore that night in 1866 from the Netherby and placed around the two children sitting on the rocks that were cold and shivering. This today is held as a memento in the local museum. And you might say, but wouldn't have this been wet? Of course it was wet. But one of the remarkable things about wool is that even though it was sopping wet, it would keep you warm. Now, the story of the Netherby did not end there. There was 500 people on the shore and they were camped in makeshift shelters and tents, but they did not know where they were. Now, again, they were lucky because they'd sent a search party north and there'd been one very big change since the wreck of the Kataraki 20 years before. It took them three days to cover the 40 kilometres to Cape Wickham Light. But when they got there, there was help. This great tower had been built five years before. All the stone for the tower was quarried here, and that was no mean feat, because it's the tallest tower in the Southern Hemisphere, and I want to climb to the top. The base of the tower is massive. And these walls are three and a half metres thick. Right, that's it, Mr. Now, how many steps, mate? Uh, it's 229, Terry. <laughs> Come on, let us get started. Could be worse, it could be 230. There can't be many more ready to go, mate. A few to go yet, Terry. Let's have a spell for a minute, Robin. I'll tell you a little story about this light. When this light was first put in, it wasn't marked on all the charts. And the sailing ships had come halfway across the world and they're heading for Otway Light on the Victorian coast. And all of a sudden they seen this light and they thought, hell, this must be Otway. And they knew they had a sail south of it, so they sailed south and straight into the reefs. Disaster. So it really, it caused more wrecks than it saved when it was first put in. history in a climb like this when you consider that for nearly 130 years men have been climbing up and down those stairs I'll tell you what it's some climb but I think it's worth it when you get here have a look at this it's magnificent I always thought that lighthouses had really one purpose you'd put them somewhere where there was dangerous reefs to warn ships to be careful and also to give them a bearing. But they had another very important point. They always kept six months supply of food in a place like this when it was unsettled. Just take the Netherby as an example. When those survivors got ashore, the whole 500 of them, they came up this coast and all of a sudden tomorrow morning, the lighthouse keeper has 500 extra mouths to feed. Hence the six months supply of food. Never knew that. But of course today, Wickham Light is automatic. But it still has to be maintained. Before I leave here, there's one other little thing I'd like to show you. And it's this grave. Now this is the grave of Captain Branscombe. Now his ship was wrecked out on this reef at about this time of the evening, just on dusk. And all the passengers and the captain got ashore safely. 
Then he decided to go back out to the wreck and get the ship's log and his papers. And in so doing, he drowned. The Katarake was wrecked because somebody suggested the captain was a coward. Captain Branscombe lost his life for a bundle of papers. Now what I'm trying to illustrate here is, you get all this talk about gales and storms at sea that cause the wrecks. But I believe, often, it's because of man himself. And of course, I'm not just telling you that, I'm really telling me. Because in the morning, I'm going out to check my cray pot. The science of catching crayfish will never become perfect, but Steve Bishop, who's been fishing bass straight for eight years, tells me that he keeps daily notes of phases of the moon, tide changes, wind, anything at all that may help him understand better when the crayfish are crawling so that he could get better catches. These fishermen do not like to take risks. But as careful as they are, accidents do happen. Got it. And in fact, in the last 20 years around King Island, there has been eight such accidents, shipwrecks. And in every case, it was fishermen. Now, the sea is the problem for all this. The unpredictable sea. And 10 metre waves here are quite common. In fact, just a little south of here, where they have a scientific base, taking readings with a boy called the Wave Rider. They've recorded seas there over 20 metres, the highest recordings of anywhere in the world. And the information that that Wave Rider supplies is vital to these fishermen. And by two o'clock in the morning, the wind was, I'd estimate, about 60 knots or 65 knots. It was whistling. It was just picking water up off, off the ocean and just whipping it in. About every third wave was coming over, over the deck. And we're in 30 fathoms of water, and. I felt the boat lift, so I throttled, straight away throttled back and she went down a wash and started bearing in the wash ahead of us and went right, probably up, nearly up to the mast in the wave and I looked back up behind me and it still looked about 15, 18 feet above us and it was coming down, it was just breaking like you see on the beach, just breaking, I said, oh Christ, here we go, but just as it hit the back of the boat, the nose managed to lift up. So instead of going in for in, we came up out of it. I turned to one of the crew at the time and he was as white faced as I was and I really, the dry cleaner and I know how close it was. And I said, this is no place for Mrs. Bishop's little boy. No worries at all. But they still come out here. I suppose it's a matter of economics because the craze they catch here bring big prices back on the mainland. What they're really on about is a treasure hunt, the treasures of the sea. And that's what I'm on about, because we're coming up to my pot now. Look, I've had one, he's just got a one. Did you see it? Tim Jack. I had one right to the top, and he's just unhooked himself and got off. Well, you win some and you lose some. I just lost one. Now, before we head in, there's one other thing Steve Bishop has offered to show me. Now, this is New Year Island. It's just off the coast of King Island.
I'm looking forward to this little excursion because this island is renowned for two unique things. One of them I'm looking forward to seeing and the other one I hope I don't run into at all because that is a tiger snake. They're in plague proportions on this island and they're the most venomous in the world. So much so that the scientists come here to collect the snakes and their venom. This I did not expect, a very unusual piece of nature. These look like fossilised trees, but really they're not. Now what happened here was that water, rich in calcium, followed the roots of the trees down, and as it did so, the calcium slowly made a cast around the roots, and now of course, the sand has long since blown away, leaving these shells exposed. In the 1860s, even before King Island was settled, two Chinese landed on this island and they started up a market garden. And when they had a crop to sell, they'd light a fire and send up smoke to the passing ships and then sell their crop to the captain. Now this worked very well for a number of years. Then one of the Chinese got bitten by a tiger snake and he died. And wasn't very long afterwards, the other one, he left the island. But when he left, he'd left a very good crop of cabbages. And over the years, they have evolved into this, which they call the cabbage trees. Watch it, Jack. Watch the truth. Look at that. You'll notice I didn't grab a stick and try to club it to death. That would have been a very foolish act. Because if you look at the snake bite victims, they very seldom ever get bitten by the snake attacking them. It's always them attacking the snake. So take my tip, don't do it. And besides that, they're protected. I'm legally not allowed to do it. So you remember that. Leave them alone. There's a little bit more to that cabbage tree story. Some of the fishermen on the island have told me that over on this island, these cabbage trees go to 20 feet in height. Now I've been over this island, I haven't found one near that height. And I really think that it might be one of those fishermen stories. What do you think? Everything I've shown you so far has had something to do with the sea and I thought it's about time I showed you one of the other faces of King Island. Where I am here is right over on the east coast of King Island. In fact, the sea's just over there. Now that tunnel is the start of four kilometres of roads right down to the work face. And where they're carting this ore from is 300 metres below sea level. In fact, some of the tunnels go out under the sea. And where I am here is 50 metres below sea level. What they mine here is shelite, and they've mined it here for 70 odd years. Now, shelite is the natural form of tungsten, and tungsten is a very special metal. It has the highest melting point of all known metals, and so it has some special applications. Most light bulb filaments are made of tungsten. So are high speed cutting tools, because if you want to cut something hard, you have to use something harder. But the real use of tungsten is in the strategic field.
Tungsten is essential to the manufacture of most of the equipment and weapons of modern war. It's not because tungsten only has military uses, but it's only in the time of war that the major powers choose to draw on a supply as remote as this. A few years ago, you could read in any guidebook that this mine was the mainstay of the economy of King Island. At the moment, more than half the houses in the township of Grassy are empty. The mine is still operating, but nobody can say for sure for how much longer. If it has to close, King Island will not only be left with a big hole in the ground, but a big hole in its economy. And because of that, the economy of the island, the way the whole place works, is worth looking at. Getting this bread reminds me of when I was a lad, when I would go to get the bread and then eat the middle out of it, and then get a whack behind the ear when I got home. Now this is beautiful bread, and everybody on the island takes it for granted. You can always get bread here. But on an island, really, you can't take anything for granted, especially the staff of life. In the early days, if you wanted a loaf of bread, you baked it yourself. That's providing someone had remembered to order the flour from the mainland, and then someone else had remembered to load it onto the ship. And then, of course, if the ship managed to get into the port, you had your loaf of bread. These days, things are not so bad, but it's very expensive to bring anything from the mainland. Because markets are remote, starting a new industry on King Island isn't easy. Neither is rescuing an old one. A few years ago, a local dairy industry nearly collapsed, trying to do what mainland farmers could do more cheaply. But lately, they've started taking a new approach, and it's paying off. The entire output of King Island dairy farms is now going into products like these. Gourmet lines of butter and cream and particularly cheese. Products designed to compete, not with the mainland, but with imports from Europe. And suddenly the freight costs from here don't seem too bad. Any more than it does for Steve Bishop's craze. Ah. On an island of 2,000 people, there are over 200 clubs and organisations. Now, most of these are essential, but nearly all of them are voluntary. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is living on an island is an isolated existence. So everybody has to buck in and help each other out. People say, the first lesson you learn when you come to King Island is that you must rely on your own initiative. I wonder how many people realise what they're looking at when they see this. This has been one of the great success stories of King Island. It just shows that in bad economic times, when farmers were forced to earn an extra dollar, they've gone out and harvested this stuff. The majority of us, every day of our life, either eat, drink or wear a derivative that comes out of this. For this is bull kelp. The giant bull kelp grows in vast underwater forests off the northern coast of Tasmania. And when the rough seas tear it loose from the bottom, it invariably washes up onto the beaches.
15 years ago, this industry did not exist. And a lot of the locals say that they were very lucky that it turned up. But in actual fact, they created this industry. It was created by people looking for something to keep them going in the bad times. For Sue Cullen, it's a good way to supplement her family income. I've been carting more or less 10 years on and off when I need to sort of get out there and need the new washing machine or whatever. I don't mind getting wet for that, but it's quite good. It's a pretty free sort of life. You can you know, be home at three for when the children come from school, and that's the important thing. Now, as it happens, certain seedweeds are the only source of what is called alginates tasteless, harmless thickening agents. Now they are used in everything from jelly and ice cream to paint and toothpaste. And bull kelp like this is the richest source of all. It takes two weeks hanging like this to get the kelp dry enough to be treated. It gets shredded and then kiln dried. And this is how it finishes up. But guess where it goes to be refined? Scotland. But some of it finishes up back here in the end. Beautiful. Have a look at that. Isn't that magic? That is a magic sight. Beautiful prime beef. Beautiful. This really is the big success story of King Island, their beef industry. In fact, the islanders claim that they have the best beef in Australia. And they get no argument from me over that. It is magnificent. And when I had it for dinner the other night, it wins hands down. Magnificent stuff. The first people to come to the island were not the farmers and the settlers, but sealers. And here, like everywhere else in Bass Strait, it wasn't long before the seal colonies were all killed out and this business stopped. But some of the sealers settled here on the island and to earn a living they would go catching possums and wallabies and uh, even salvaging some of the stuff off the wrecks and probably even a little bit of smuggling on the side. Now this was before Tasmania and Victoria were even settled. And what I'm doing here today, I'm going out to see one of the real characters of the island. Brady Crack is one of the island's pioneer cattlemen. He was born here, in fact, in 1911, and he assures me that he wishes to die here. Like all original islanders, he remembers the bygone era. If anything went wrong, your neighbours came to help you. If you was crook, I helped you, and if I was crook, you come and help me. And my mother only went to curry once a month. And she used to get a seven pound tin of treacle, seven pound tin of golden syrup, a, a gross of matches and great big packets of candles. She made everything, uh, the bread, 
the biscuits, the buns, cakes and everything. And I think I would be around about 23 before I ever remember eating baker's bread. And when we were kids, we used to hop through the window and pinch the apples. We never knew that used to live with us. He happened to look in a, a packet and seen what he thought was chocolates. Anyhow, he got these chocolates and brought them out to us and we all had a feed, or a couple each. If they weren't chocolates, they were laxettes. Mum didn't have to ask who pinched the chocolates, she knew. <laughs> we, we were very busy boys, I'll tell you. <laughs> If anyone's a farmer, King Isle's a paradise. You've got grass 12 months of the year, and you don't get droughts. I've seen it get dry, and, but I, I've never seen people's cattle dying for the want of water and stuff like that. I've never seen it in my life. Old timers like Brady prefer not to drive. But anyhow, when you've got scenery like this, who would want to drive? A motor car, as far as I can see, it's just a motor car, but a horse is something to look at. I can't drive a motor car, I can't drive a tractor. A motor car, well, I suppose they're all right, but when they get bogged, you can't do nothing with them. A horse has sort of been part of my life. Just look at those cattle. Don't they look marvellous? And the reason for this is a story in itself, centred around a man called Giles. Now, he brought his cattle ashore on the southern end of the island at a place called Surprise Bay. But to Giles' surprise, when he got here, there was a very good pasture here from a plant called Metalot. And the theory is the seeds contained in the straw mattresses which were washed ashore from the shipwrecks were credited with the introduction of Melilot to King Island. Melilot is truly a remarkable plant because not only is it one of the finest pastures in the world, but its root systems go right down into the soil, loosening them up. And also, it puts nitrogen into the soil. Now, this plant was unknown on King Island. It's an unnatural plant to the place. But what Giles did was to go around his property collecting the seeds and stuffing them into a sugar bag. And then as he went around, he threw them out everywhere, cast them around. And he was responsible for this plant on King Island, which is truly one of the finest pastures in the world. There's never been a rabbit and as far as I know, there's never been foxes on King Island. The pastures and grass and everything's improving. I think that the land here would be an equivalent to any land that I've seen in Tasmania or Victoria. Isn't that just magic? Sprucing up the cattle. Now there's a very good reason for this, as today is a special day. The only day the whole island stops, for today is King Island's annual show. Everyone brings their cattle and their produce to exhibit. And it is magnificent produce. As behind all the hard work and the smiles lies the serious business of farming. Right, that's, that's, that's a bit of fat there. Yeah, isn't a bit it? of fat pushing right. there, but that one laying down is too fat, that's a good cow there. Right. And uh, you're always looking for this nice flat across here. Yeah. Right. But the show is not only about cattle. There's everything you'd expect to find, and a few things you might not find anywhere else. Normal onion. Have a look at the King Island onions. Marvellous. Look at the size of the thing. Nearly everything is judged. Wool, flowers, and of course the cakes. 
Yes, I'll just have a little taste of that because oh, I want to find out what the filling is. That's not going to do your figure any good. <laughs> And believe it or not, they wrote me in to judge their art show. That's more interesting, see? Because if they're, they're showing the light source and they're, they're knocking it right down, there it is. Yes. There's no argument about it, see? Yes. I think this bloke, he's got a lot of talent. But it's not all serious. People come here really to have a good time and a chance to have a go. And age doesn't seem to matter. Now, as it happens, I'm not a bad shot, so I'm going to have a go at this. Win a few, lose a few. I think I need a little bit of practice. But the main thing is to participate. As I walk around here, the thing that hits me most is that really this is about a family get-together, a family reunion, where neighbours and families and relations all come together in a marvellous picnic atmosphere. And this is what this show is all about. You get this marvellous feeling of comradeship and friendship, and you could hardly realise that really you're only one hour out of Melbourne. And if people never leave this island, then they will never be amongst strangers, simply because everybody here is their friends. Now it's back to business. Brady's mob is being judged, and he's told me, quite confidentially, that these cows are his best chance of winning a prize. Brady came out all right, but then, at this show, everyone is a winner. Brian Rodwell and company. Congratulations, Selma. Thanks, Mike. Even if the local politician is having a hard time getting a kiss. I might get a double header here. There you are, I think you better have that. Give us a kiss for us, Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> And by golly, if you let me down with a kiss, I'm going to go home very, very disappointed. So you're my last chance, I can tell you. Congratulations and very well done. Thank you. Thank you, In the past, getting by here has been a bit of a challenge. But what people are close to is the sea and the land. And they have a very strong sense of their own past. And King Island is tough enough to throw up a lot of challenges, but it's also small enough for the people to handle them. I'd like to have seen it when the first settlers arrived on King Island, which is all scrub. It might be a funny old place, but to me it's home. One time you had to travel on the boat, and if you travelled on the boat to King Island, you never went off again, because you're too damn frightened to get back on the boat, because it made you that damn sick, you wouldn't get back on it again. You stayed on King Island. When I first came here, the islanders told me that it was often called the Forgotten Island. But now that I've been here, I find a touch of charm in the place. With all the beautiful rugged coastline and the people are so friendly. 
so that I would really like to rename this island, not the Forgotten Island, but I'd like to call it the Magic Island.